introduce a person who traveled here from Michigan, came in last night, it's four degrees in Michigan, and uh, she came to a beautiful place. Professor Leanne holliday Willey, who holds a doctorate in psycholinguistics, was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome when she was 35 years old. Since her diagnosis, Leanne has focused her academic research on females with Asperger's syndrome and communication skills for people on the spectrum. Leanne is the author of the new book, Safety Skills for Asperger Women, How to Save a Perfectly Good Female Life, and the author of the international best-selling books, Pretending to be Normal, Living with Asperger's Syndrome, Asperger's Syndrome in Adolescence, Living with the Ups, the Downs, and the Things in Between, Asperger's Syndrome in the Family, Redefining Normal. She's also the senior editor of Autism Spectrum Quarterly. She's a blogger for Psychology Today and a consultant with Brains, the Behavioral Resources and Institute for Neuropsychological Services. Leanne has been featured in USA Today, the Associated Press, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, Autism One Radio, Oxygen TV, several NPR stations, and many other media outlets. Professor Willie received her EDD from Mississippi State University in 1988. Though Professor Willie loves helping others understand Asperger's syndrome, her professional employment happens at Kirkshire Farms, an equestrian facility she owns and operates. Please welcome warmly Professor Wiling. Oh, hi everybody. That's a light right there, isn't it? Dang. Lights? A little maybe down? Okay. So I'm Leanne. Whoop, oh, nope. Hold on. Okay. I'm Leanne Holiday Willie, and it's nice to meet you all. Thank you to our very gracious hosts and to all of you who have come to see me from the land of cold ice and lots of lakes. My daughters always say to me, You should know by now, and I'm going to get this wrong. I think we're in an island, but I think Michigan's a peninsula. Whatever it is, I'm coming to you from there. So I know it's attached to things, but that's up in the UP. So. My presentation is about how I have been able to move from moderately, um, a person with moderate Asperger's syndrome to someone who today would not qualify in the DSM-5 as having Asperger's syndrome, though I was diagnosed by um, Tony Atwood, who's a very brilliant uh, clinical psychologist from Britain who now lives in Australia. And he had to meet my parents, look at my old records, study my early influences and my early behaviors to really get a diagnosis at 35, because by then I was you know, able to really fake my way in the neurotypical world, and I had ferreted out all the little clues and all the social skills that made me look really successful. What I was never able to do, and I'm still not able to do, is uh, erase the anxiety and the confusion that comes from doing all that. So when I talk to you and I come up here and I you know, sort of look like anyone else and, and speak like anyone else and, and have um, you know, decent communication skills, the fact is that inside I'm having to consciously work on my hard drive to say, do this, do that, do this, do that. It's, none of it is intrinsic. None of it comes naturally. But I've mastered it. And I, I've never heard the word recovered before addressed to autism. I, I find that uh, quite interesting. I wouldn't say that I'm recovered so much as I'm um, happier and more able to do what I want to do without going home and circling and, and you know, fetal position in my closet. Closet. So I was able to get a doctorate and get married, and I have three daughters. One is on the spectrum. One is, uh, has an official ADHD, they're t my twins. One is on the spectrum, and one has an ADHD diagnosis. But they do manifest behaviors in, in uh, very similar ways. Um, in fact, the one who is more socially inept has the ADHD diagnosis, and the one who is more socially keen does not. I think that's my uh, own version of uh, home therapy that made the difference there. I took my daughter who was like me and I gave her all the tricks of the trade that my father had taught me, his mother had taught him. I have a cousin with regular autism. It's, our family's in genetic studies. I mostly work with the Brits, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, Francesca Hape, Uta Frith, um, Fra Dr. Gould, Dr. Judith Gold. They're, I don't know why, but you know, I do some with Yale, but for the most part, I'm, I'm a British, I, you know, okay, whatever. So I, I do my things with them. I'm, I'm kind of their bug under the microscope. So um, it's their work that's helped me become um, pretty comfortable in my skin. I wasn't always that way. 
and uh, I'll, I'll share with you those stories now. So my intent is that you'll have heard um, these great speakers tell us what uh, autism spectrum is, some of the new promises and developments and, and neuroscience behind it all, and then I come in and say, okay, this is how it kind of feels. Mind you, when you've met one of us, you've met one of us. I'm very different from someone else. My father would talk like this and say, why did you write that book in so many words? I could say it in 10 words, do it again. You know, we're all, and my daughter that's on the spectrum just doesn't talk. She just looks at you and smiles and she's gorgeous. So she just smiles and everyone says, oh, isn't she nice? No, she's not nice, but she has a look that's very nice. So she's not. So this is me. Oh, that thing about lying. I don't lie. I don't know how to lie. I didn't know that I was supposed to know this at four. I don't understand. Here's my thought. Okay, here's my bias. Theory of mind. If we all said what we were exactly thinking, we wouldn't have a need for theory of mind. If I ask you if I look fat in this outfit, I don't want you to say yeah. I don't care if I look fat or not to begin with, but I want you to say yes or no. If I say, am I speaking too fast? I don't want you to say no and then whisper to your friend, I can't understand her. I only, I, but then my mother, my mother who's nothing but neurotypical will say to me, Leanne Willie, the truth may set you free, but it doesn't set me free. So. <laughs> So that's, that's what happens to me in my life. So this is my beautiful horse. I have four. This is Charlie, and we match, I was matching eyes. This is on the cover of my new book. Wait, is this a new book? I don't, I don't know which one. I think it's, crap, I don't even know what book it is. One of the books I wrote, Safety Skills, maybe. I don't, oh, it's the new edition of Pretending to be Normal. That came out in a new edition. Okay. And I'm now doing a book on movement and how it affects people on the spectrum. We're doing yoga, tai chi, we're going out into the holistic, we're coming back in with uh, equine therapy, hippotherapy. So if you have anybody that is really interested in writing a chapter, I get to be their boss and I would love, because I know uh, California and New York tend to be the big spots in America for our research. So if you have uh, anything you'd like to share, hit me up on Aspie News at Yahoo and, and uh, maybe we can get together. So there's my stuff. All right, so who are we? Uh, you know, this is sort of the layman's version of who we are. We're not bound by class or gender. We do find out that people uh, in minority groups are not um, diagnosed as readily as the middle class white kids are. We know there's a myriad of reasons for that, stemming from everything from um, you know, possible fear of authority or run-ins with uh, authority figures who have done you know, the profiling or whatever. And also, English as a second language can interfere with that. And so can the fact that a lot of kids who are um, from minority populations maybe don't make it to school as often. And, and, and I, by, by minority populations, I mean like ESL kids. You know, and they're, they're working and they're doing it. I sound like such a bigot when I say this, and I don't know how to say it because it's from research. I, I want, my bottom line is, I want all these kiddos and all these adults in our group. I'm just telling you reasons why, you know, um, social scientists have said they think we don't get these kids. Um, and it's a shame because it's nothing other than finances and finding them and making them feel loved and supported. So we, if there's no reason why we don't have these kids and these adults in our group. They're there. We're just not finding them or they're not finding us. So anyway, we're capable of lovely lives. You know, I, uh, I have a real big prejudice about... Um, or I'm going to say it, and, and, and I, I shouldn't, I promised my husband I wouldn't say this, but he's not here. <laughs> and um, with all due respect to people who want to uh, cure autism, I would love to help the children and the adults who are really struggling in life because of autism. I have relatives who cannot go to the bathroom uh, when they need to, they just drop, trow, and go. I, I know what it's like to have a child who throws the dog off the stairs. I know what it's like to have a knife pulled on me. I understand how difficult more severe autism can be. I also understand that my brain works in a way that's fascinating. I understand that my father, who was never a part of any group, who was beat up most every day of his life, helped design the F-15 airplane and helped J Gus Grissom survive his first failed um, uh, um, Gemini trip. He tried to tell Gus what to do for a second and Gus died. Um, I think there is something to be had in our brain and I am not one that's going to tell you to get rid of it. However, I will be one that says help us fit into this society. Help us be the best we can be. And like Temple Grandin, I just, that's, that's my theory. So I don't want to be a brat about it. Just 
when I hear things like that from wherever I go, and I hear it every, everywhere I go, I think of my dad. And I think of how they wanted to take him out of school and how they wanted to put him in a special institution and not send him to college. And he was one of the most brilliant men in the world. And it, it makes my skin crawl. So um, I, I have to do that for my daddy because I, 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 there's no one better in the world than my, my dad. So that's my little speech. We have a neurobiological difference. Clearly, you've heard a ton about that these past couple days, or <laughs> these past couple hours. I'm going to try to pull this away when I cuss. cuss. So. <laughs> A peek inside, you know, I say an ADS mind. This is inside my mind, my real experiences that came. I used to out my daughter. I might out her in this slide, but normally I don't because you could figure out which one she is. So subjective rules make no sense. How do I know how to behave? Okay, this is me, the little boy without shorts on. That's not really me. But as a kid, until I was about 10, I saw no point in wearing a shirt because none of the boys wear a shirt, so why would I wear a shirt? No girl in Europe wears shirts. So who's decided that in America we must wear shirts? I'm philosophically opposed, not now, I wouldn't bring these babies out for anything, but back then I didn't see why I would have to be in clothing that was tight and restrictive and disgusting while the boys were running around, you know, half naked. So this would be me, and I remember when I went to my first teen party at the pool, we do have pools in the Midwest, even though it's a two month, you know, opening. And, um, and I would be like, you know, taking my top off, like, oh wait, no, hold on. Cognating, top stays on, memorize, top stays on. Okay, then you're a little older and you go to a skinny dipping party. No, top stays on. Oh, you're not cool. We're 18, we can skinny dip. Top stays on. The rules have changed. So I never quite fit in. A big deal, okay, I, didn't, I did or didn't take my top off. That's not a big deal. But when all of these things add up, it does interfere with your quality of social life and your quality of life and your quality of happiness. And those are the things I would like to help our kiddos with and our elderly um, more than I, I think we tend to do. So I wasn't sure how to behave. My daughter uh, went to, um, uh, found a, a pit bull in a car. The car was turned on, the pit bull was trying to get out, she was at a gym, she flipped out, she's 24, she, she's, a <laughs> she's actually in politics, so that's a little, hmm. Um, so she uh, was banging on the window, couldn't get the window open, and was trying to break it. Well, these two big bodybuilders come out, and they're, they're like accosting her. How dare you? My dog will tear you up. And you, my daughter has a pit bull. She's not afraid of pit bulls. She starts having a huge confrontation. Somebody calls the police. The police come, and my daughter is having a fit. Long story short, the policeman tells my daughter to leave, to go in and wait and speak to her later. And he said, um, you know, it's, it is wrong to have your dog in the car, but, you know, we're not, it's nice weather. And my daughter said, it's illegal to have a car running while no one's in it. That could hurt a child. She tumped, trumped the policeman. The policeman didn't like that. You can see where this is going. About three months later, my daughter had to go to the bathroom. She has no bladder control, and she was at a tailgate. She was not drunk. She was on a college campus. She dropped her and went. She got arrested. It would cost her $2,500 to get that expunged from her record. And I said, you know, if you would get your, a note from your doctor saying that you have bladder issues, that would be, they would throw it out. She doesn't want anybody to know. She doesn't want anyone to know she has any differences. She said that she's on the autism spectrum two times in her life, and both times were in defense of my father. So um, I'm just taking off my shirt. <laughs> she's getting into, you know, not a breakdown fight. She's been beat up. She's been black-eyed. She's been strangled. She's been abused. It does interfere with your life. Reality or pretend? If you're old, you'll remember this. Do you remember PF Flyers made you run fast and jump high? And I heard this commercial over and over, and my goal was to be the fastest person in the fifth grade. And I finally talked my Scottish, very um, cheap father, or as he says, frugal, into um, buying me PF Flyers. And I'm telling you what, I, I was like supersonic fast. I think it was probably because I had the placenta, uh, placenta what the hell? I had the placebo effect. And um, that's disgusting. And, um, so, but I did. I, I worked well with it. And then, though, uh, so I'm telling, saying to my dad, no, dad, this is real. My time is faster. So I saw a commercial for Wonder Bread, which made you grow. <laughs> so I ate. I wanted to be 5'8", and I'm only, okay, I'm 5'5 five, five and a half, and that half is essential. So I got to, I ate this entire, I was eating loaves of Wonder Bread every day and making my dad measure me every day. 
and I never grew. And he waited me out like a good ABA guy. He waited me out and eventually said, see, it's not helping you. So, you know, you can't, he taught me statistics. I have dyscalculia, I can't do mathematics, but I can understand research design and I can understand the concept of probability and statistics. I just can't calculate them. So, um, you know, I, I learned the hard way what propaganda was. Again, why is this a big deal? Because at this age, I'm 55, I still go through life saying, is that true, are you telling a joke? Is that, a, are you being, like, is, that, is that an idiom? Where that idiom? Do you know where that idiom came from? I know where that idiom came from. Do you know that is an idiom? What do you know about English? Because I'm a linguist, do you, they're gone. I've lost them, they've left the room. So my friends are few and far between because I don't want to talk about the color of their dress or the black and white, gold and red, whatever the dress, what, who gives a shit dress, sorry. I had concussions too, so that's, I'm using that now. I've had major concussions many times because my horses. So I'm allowed to, to curse. So, so you begin to feel sort of like a fool and sort of like you're not smart. And um, that's no fun because the only thing I take pride in is, is I have a decent intellect and I have a decent sense of humor. So when those things are stripped from me, when I miss a joke or when I have not used uh, or I've not understood uh, you know, a, a part of speech or a conversation or I've left in the middle because it was boring or whatever, I've told the truth that apparently four-year-olds don't know to not do, I, um, I'm left alone. And even though I was, and I'm not bragging here, I'm just giving you an example because this means nothing to me. I was on uh, the dance courts all through high school. I just got elected to my high schools, and it's a huge high school in St. Louis, Missouri, um, Hall of Fame. I'm like, oh, I'm getting letters. We thought you had it all together. You were the smartest, funny. I was just doing what I could to make people laugh at me and not beat me up. And I used my humor, and that got me through. Now those, those folks that knew me are reading my, my books and saying, you know what, now that you mention it, now they're spilling how weird they thought I was. But because I was funny, I got away with it. So I taught my kids to use their, intelli their, their repertoire of jokes. And I have books where I memorize the jokes and I would tell them. And then I took speech and drama from the time I was like five till well, I was in community theater as an adult. And that's what taught me comfort in front of uh, crowds. This is way easier for me than talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. I could do this all day. You, you want to have drinks with me and I start to like hyperventilate. I'll have to take a pill to get through it. And so that's way more difficult. Um, I learned about vocal content and prosody and um, tone and uh, you know, articulation and eye contact. And, I told Dr. Atwood that I could not be on the spectrum because I, I didn't think I was. And I said, I can't be. I make really good eye contact. And he said in his English voice, he said, no, you don't, Leanne. You stare like a wolf, and that's criminal and frightening. <laughs> and I said, well, what are you? No, I'm, I'm staring at I'm making eye contact. And he said, that's staring. Eye contact is a give and take. So now I, I tell my, every conversation I have, unless it's with, like, my husband, who is weirder than I am, I just... I'll stare, and then when I'm talking, I look away, and my head is saying, you're looking away, and I'll say, I'm looking away. Oh, did you hear that? I didn't mean to say that. I'm looking at you now. So my internal voice is always external. It's always external. So you hear what's inside and out, and sometimes they don't match. So it's really, because I'm talking about me, not you, and you're like, why? Okay. So routines are never routines. I did this because I, I feel like my life is uh, in um, a house of mirrors or a house of glass, and it's very creepy. I cannot stand to the point where I'm in marriage counseling. I'll be home at noon, noon 05, noon 10, noon, you know, it's one o'clock. I've watched, you know, three Judge Judy's. It's now 4.30 and he's still not home or my daughter's not home. I have, I'm calling, I'm legitimately calling hospitals. 9-11, you can imagine, when I couldn't get a hold of anybody. These are the things that affect us in daily life. You know, you get a call from the school. Now, this is me as an adult. Pretend you're a kid and you, um, <laughs> wow, we, all of a sudden that got on me. Pretend you're a kid and the uh, recess is canceled or your teacher didn't show up or, you know, the person that you thought was going to ask you out for the Valentine's dance asked your best friend. Every kid deals with the anxiety and the confusion of those times. But for us, we don't have a quick rehab. We don't have a quick excuse, escape, second plan. It's that plan or no plan. So we can have a meltdown, a breakdown, a disappearance, um, loss of self-esteem, all those things. 
Again, each little piece is what makes your life harder. It's like playing Jenga. You've taken another little piece out. One on its own, eh, two, eh. But when you start to pull off little pieces of you, you lose who you are. Then you overcompensate, and you become somebody who says, when the boys say to you, Gee, okay, I'm going to rip that light out. <laughs> when the boys come to you and say, all the fun girls put out, and you get the definition of put out, and you go, well, I'm fun, and they go, prove it, and you do. And then you find out that that's not what all the fun girls do. Well, you didn't know that. And now you're at the doctor, and now you're, you know, you're having date rapes, and now you're... That's my experience. I took things literally. Boys, predators, from business, I had somebody go bankrupt on our farm. It's a half a million dollar farm. My husband's a professor. I'm a writer and a rider. We don't make money to pay for a home, three kids, college education, and a half a million dollar barn. We don't. So, you know, our dilemma is I get involved with people and I can, and ev virtually every one of my experiences has proven that I will be hurt, either physically, mentally, or emotionally. And I cannot think of one where that hasn't happened, except from my father. So, gosh, I'm so glad the, the doctors today were talking about sensory integration dysfunction. This is the one thing I cannot cognate my way out of. Thank you, God bless you, and I love you. You can um, do what you can to wear soft clothes. I, I understand I can do some of that. But for the most part, the world is full of sensory integration. My horses and I are one because I um, spirit and move uh, faster than they do. So my horses have to take care of me because I'm spooking and then they're like, what is it? And we're off we go. So uh, iron, I love heat. And my dad said I, I would touch the, the stove and he kept saying hot, hot, hot. Yeah, hot, hot, hot. And one day I put the uh, iron on my wrist and it sizzled up and I have a big scar there which later turned out to teach me right from left. But it, um, <laughs> it, it, I don't, it didn't hurt. It hurt, but it didn't hurt. I mean, I felt it, but it didn't hurt. I have, uh, I had a colon resection, like, I lost like 22 inches of my colon, I, I the leaky gut stuff. I didn't even know I was having a colon attack. I was throwing up and I had the signs, but I didn't know. I had natural childbirth, my twins were each almost seven pounds, my daughter was 10 pounds. I'm just like, I don't want medicine, just get this thing out, pop, pop, go, you know. So I don't, I have that weird pain syndrome where uh, I have had self-injurious behaviors because I have to do something to feel it just to feel my body and earth. I, I, I want to jump off of here to feel my legs. I have a, a weird sense of my body in space. Well, now that's caught up with me, and I have arthritis and headaches, and my neuroimaging wasn't good, and um, the kitty cat's me spooking. Ah! Um, and the noise, oh my Lord have mercy. Hearing my voice in my head makes me want to cut out my vocal cords. I cannot stand the vibration that I'm hearing in my jaws, in my head, it's the most Annoying and I was going to be a broadcaster. I know I have a decent voice, but I don't like to I don't want to hear it I want to shut it. You know, I want to close it off Noises don't go away. I can hear rattling of dishes as loud as I can hear people talking So for me, it's an auditory processing. I can't separate foreground from background. That's extremely annoying Especially when you have kids you're trying to be a good mom You're in the front car of your massive suburban and they're in the back all three talking to you at once And all you hear is Charlie Brown noises, you know blah, you know, I can't understand them, and it makes me very uncomfortable, and it makes them very angry, and then they start throwing things at my head, and then it's a whole other kind of day. <laughs> so I, there's the tags from the clothes. We talked about that. There's, my mother said uh, the first few years that she would take me places. She said she'd bring three or four outfits because by the time we got to where we were going, I would always be stark naked. Because in the 50s, well, when I, was, I was born in 59. In the early 60s, it was still the, the, the scratchy... Um, um, the scratchy dresses and um, the girls, I couldn't wear pants until I was in uh, seventh grade. So it was the skirts and I liked tight clothes on my, you know, it didn't work. So forget just the top, I was like, I was like nudist camp kid. <laughs> and then the, that's, that little guy is a gallbladder. My husband wants, th these men were asking me if I knew, uh, we were at a volleyball tournament and the women don't hang out with me. So I was hanging out with the, girl, the guys and they were asking me if I knew this doctor they played golf with. And I said, yeah, he was my surgeon. Oh, what'd you have done? And I said, well, I had a colon resection. Do you want to see my scar? And I was telling them they acted interested. So I was getting very involved in the surgery. My husband pulls me aside and he said, that's disgusting. A, nobody wants to see your scar. And B, nobody wants to hear about such an embarrassing um, surgery. 
And I said, well, that's not true because Katie Couric just did a thing on colons and I think it's good to be a spokesperson for, you know, um, gastroenteritis and um, what do I have, diverticular disease. I think that's good. No, they were embarrassed and now you've embarrassed the whole family. And so I went into the janitor's closet after hearing this and stayed there the whole day and missed my kids playing because I thought I was doing a good thing. And I was mortified to have anyone tell me, you've just embarrassed the whole family. Now, in hindsight, I have, of course, come up to those men and said, did I embarrass you? How much damage did I do to our friendships? And I have made my husband apologize profusely. I don't know who's telling the truth, but I don't care. If you, I, I'm right to tell you about what can happen to your body when bad things happen. It's like not mentioning breast cancer. Of course you do, duh. So the man from the South, which is my husband, can just suck it because that's not how it goes. <laughs> Oh, and yes, he'll see this and go, oh, here we go again. So special interest and other, what does that say? Special interests are not often appreciated, supported, or encouraged. Okay, so that would be my husband on the left. Let me ask you something. They're golfing, it's windy, it's rainy. They're probably going to get electrocuted, and they'll talk about the 18th hole, the 13th hole, like it was the first coming of God. And you'll think of, it's, it's fabulous if you're a golfer or a baseball player or a brilliant scientist, and you know, that's fantastic. But my father, the man on the right, designed a, um, a steam engine kit that went into his car and saved considerably uh, in gas. And this was in the 70s when we had to stand in line to get gas and the oil companies were really tight. We weren't being able to buy our product. And um, all he wanted to talk about was how he had, it was gonna change the environment. He's an old farmer and you know, turned engineer through, uh, back in the day. And this was a 67 Cougar. He never, the lights used to go on and off. Remember, they were really cool. They go, they had a door that shut over them. That was really cool. Day one, he disconnected that because that's just a potential problem for, you know, I'm not gonna have that on there. So all the coolness of this car was slowly stripped away. But, you know, and why, no one wanted to talk to my dad about that. It could, it could, could have, those sorts of things, Priuses, we, we want those now. But somehow golf is okay, but toilet bowl water with color drops in it is boring. Me talking about my horse's feet are boring. What, who gets to decide that? This is why I can't ever find that I want to be in the normal world, the, the typical world, because I think, why isn't what my dad's doing far more interesting than what you, how far a little ball went? I try to, I defy you to explain that. You cannot. You can say, oh, golfing is good for the body. All right, great. Let's talk about that. No, you just want to talk about how you got a good shot and almost got a hole in one. I don't care. <laughs> and I like golf. It's, but, but who decides? Who decides? Unfair. So this is me at parties. The first thing I do is I do, I used to self-medicate very heavily with very toxic non-prescription drugs and I didn't do them at parties. I did them so that I could get to the party and I would drive myself to the parties fully loaded on God knows what. And then as an adult, I realized, you know, that was not only illegal, um, but it was unhealthy. And I, I went on medication per my uh, physicians. I'm now winding off of a couple of them and I'm a little uptight, so you might see a little nerves that wouldn't normally be there, but I run to go to parties and the first thing I wanna find is their pet because that pet is gonna to come to me and be nice or tell me the truth or look me in the eye and say, get out or I'm gonna bite you. They don't lie, they don't pretend, they don't talk behind your back, they don't talk in subtext, they don't use uh, linguistics and um, words and vernacular and, and jargon that I have. Okay, I went to Texas to meet my husband and he kept saying, um, what, what do you want to drink? And I said, um, I don't know, what do you have? And he said, well, I have Coke and I have um, tea. And I said, oh, I don't really want Coke and I don't really want tea. I'd really like a root beer. And he said, well, I said I had Coke. And I said, okay, yeah, but I don't want Coke. And he said, well, you just said you wanted a root beer. I said, yeah, I want a root beer. And he goes, well, I said I had Coke. And I said, yeah, I know you said you had Coke. I don't want a Coke, I want root beer. So apparently down south, Coke is vernacular for, I call it soda. In Michigan, they call it pop. Okay, whatever. It just, you know, I don't even, I don't even order it anymore because I'm afraid it's going to be a whole nother thing. And now they serve TLC, THC, TLC, THC in Washington. So watch me order that and not be able to find my way back home. So I'm just staying clear of it now. Um, and he told me once, he said, well, yeah, that dog will, that, uh, that dog will hunt. And I said, you said you didn't like dogs. And he said, I hate them. I said, well, whose dog hunts? And he goes, 
what do you mean? I said, you just said that dog will hunt. And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, where is it? I, I love dogs. Where's the dog? I, wanna, I like hunting dogs. Where's the dog that hunts? What are you talking about? He didn't even, some people use idioms and, and, and uh, vernacular so intrinsically that they forget other people don't speak that way. So I ask you, when you think about theory of mind, I'm supposed to be the one that can't read people. People that use vernacular and idioms are not reading me. How many times did I have to say, I want a root beer before my husband or any of his family members were able to say, oh, you want a soda, pop, what do you call it up north? No. How many times did I have to say, where's the dog that will hunt before they realized they were using an idiomatic expression that didn't resonate with me? So I have to double dip. I have to go into the, 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 the tiny bit of autism that I have left and work my way through that and then say, OK, I'm down south. What are the words? Now, anytime I travel somewhere, especially if I go overseas, I learn some of their catchphrases so that I am not so far behind. So who's doing? I'm, bil I'm like trilingual. And, and, and I get upset sometimes. And I know I shouldn't, but I kind of get upset when people say, well, she has autism. She doesn't understand. Um, you're not speaking correct English, so. Mm. <laughs> so nonverbal inaccuracies. This is something we really talk about in nonverbal learning disabilities. And, and there was a time when NLD was really, Dr. Bra O'Rourke was big into this, and we were getting some good money and some good finding behind NLD. And the main difference between NLD and, and say, Asperger's syndrome was sort of looking towards the math land and saying that we weren't, uh, that NLD kids had spatial relations problems and they had more hyper or more uh, dyscalculia, more problems with time and sequence and left and right and direction. And that certainly fit my profile. Um, those are the things that I haven't let go of in the, in the, the little bit of autism that I have. And so um, I think that nonverbal, what is it, is it like, it's over 80% is our, is our uh, nonverbal communication. I have, uh, all my degrees are in communications, and I think I studied what, that which I did not understand. And so when I look at people and I try to do those faces, I can see, you know, Baron Cohen, um, who, do you know he's related to, well, sh no, this is going to, never mind, it's going to be on YouTube, I'm not going to say. Okay, um, nonverbal, blah, 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 blah. I take Dr. Uh, Baron Cohen's um, mind blind reading test, and I can narrow the face down to two or three, like I know it's, per, say for example, aggravation, sadness, or uh, uh, anger. But I can't, man, it's a, a two-thirds, one-third, it's a guess if I can get it exactly right. I may hit it, I may not. It's, it's kind of a luck of the draw. So I'm close. I'm not going, that's happiness. I don't, I, the, the idea of rewards I find very interesting. I didn't realize that I was looking at people who smiled to anticipate a reward. To me, I, I'm going to investigate that with my own self. I'm, I'm always everybody's insect under the microscope. I didn't, I look at people that smile and my first thought is, what do you want from me? But see, I've been conditioned to not trust that smile. I've been conditioned to not trust those things that say, we welcome you, come in. Because that usually ends up in a rape or a bankruptcy or someone hurting you or beating up your daughter or saying your father's a loser. So I, I'm very conditioned against two friendly people. And I, I feel bad for that because there are nice, good people, but I never know who they are. And so, you know, every time before I travel, I used to call my dad. Now I call my counselor, and he gives me a list of rules. Don't sit by men, wear a wedding ring, sit by security, don't. And it's, look, it's not that I'm Miss Hot. It's just that there's predators out there. And the travelers know that. And I ran into a guy on the boardwalk yesterday that kept following me and asked me if I was married and blah, blah, blah. And, and my friend Susan, my new friend, I guess, I, can I call you a friend? Okay. <laughs> she, she said maybe the guy was uh, schizophrenic. I didn't even realize that, and that has totally blown my mind, because now I can look at people that approach me in a, in a more nurturing yet standoff way instead of, I need to be nicely in and talk to this poor man because he's just trying to be a nice guy. No, he's, it was probably going to be a kidnapping. I was probably going to be kidnapped and put in a trunk of a car. That's where my mind goes now, because I've had so many bad experiences with people. So this is how I, this is me every day. <laughs> I'm not sure. I am smart enough to go through the possible outcomes. I can do research studies with the best of them because I can think of all the possible outcomes. I'm a fabulous problem solver, if I do say so myself. My father taught me, we would go to uh, airports and we would watch people and we would go through, what do you think, the, are they married, are they boyfriend and girlfriend, are they um, a employee and employer, are they strangers, and we never knew, but we would go through the whys and what fors. So I know in my head to say, 
here's the problem, here's five possible outcomes that I can come up with. So I start to correlate. It could be this, 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 this. Okay, if it's gonna be, he's angry with me, I need to look for red face. Oh wait, that could also be embarrassment. All right, narrow it down to that. Do you see what I'm saying? I have to take my hard drive and narrow it down to where it might be, and then I make my best guess. I'm, always, I'm the hypothesis, I never know for sure. I will never, ever, I say to my husband all the time, are you lying, are you lying, are you lying, are you lying? Are you? I will never know, and, and I think he does lie. So I, you know, I won't. <laughs> the motor skills challenges, are you old enough to remember tinkling? That used to be a big thing we did in gym. And how cool is this? It's two bamboo poles. And you put them together and you chink, 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 chink. It makes a great sound. I couldn't do this to save my life. Instead of having a big IEP, I was not in special ed classes, total inclusion in the 60s and 70s. I had excellent verbal skills, so there was no chance in the world I was going to go into any kind of special ed class other than the social worker who knew that I had uh, you know, personality issues. So I, I couldn't do this. So my gym teachers, who I, I cannot give enough credit to for helping me, came to me and said, you know what, you can't do that. How about you announce it? And I'm going to, you know, they didn't say you can't do that, but they said, hey, Leanne, would you like to hold the microphone and say, and now it is time for tinkling. And so I was the announcer at all these things. I did other things for Jim. I, I had to try it. I had to attempt it. But after 10, 15, 20 minutes of stopping class, going to the nurses, breaking my, you know, my knees, all that, um, she, they came up with a way for me to be involved. Why don't you walk around the track five times and come back and announce? I was in but I wasn't in, but I was part, but I wasn't pulled out. And how wonderful. And I did things, my dad put me in dance, he put me in horses, he put me in swimming, and I got the bilateral coordination and the crossing and the midline and all of those OT things we talk about. I just didn't do it under pressure in gym. So my motor skill challenges remain. I can ride horses and I can ride them pretty good, but I can also fall off really quickly and I have lots of plates and pins. And So the, I'm trying to speed up the linguistic folly George, I'm, where are you? Where's George? When am I done? 45 minutes. Oh, I'm good. All right, I thought I had tense. I told you. What time is my clock going to say? 2.30. Okay, 2.30. Jeez, 2.23. All right, I'm going to, mm-hmm. I love numbers. Love them. So, linguistics folly. This is my bailiwick. I dig words, and, and uh, I love them, and they're so much fun to play with. And a lot, oh, I didn't wear my glasses. The first one says... Hmm? Why do I hear? Why, why do I hear people talking? What does it say under that? I don't even know what that means now. Why do I hear people talk? Why did I take my glasses off? Will you bring me my glasses? What the heck? Let's go to your hot. I can read that one. You're hot. Okay, I took that. I was working at a bar in, in Midwest Missouri. Hot, 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 hot. Thank you, thank you. And um, I was uh, serving beer, and I had spilled all over myself because of my, oh, gracias, because of my lousy, uh, you know, eye hand coordination and all that kind of thing. So I'm wearing a white t shirt, no bra, because bras are disgusting. And um, so I now, setting that background for you, I had all that background too, but I didn't understand the ramifications of it. So with that background, someone says to me, you're really hot. And I said, I'll never forget this. And I said, you'll, you don't know how hot I am. I'm super hot. <laughs> but see, you're laughing. I had no, I was hot. And I wasn't hot. I never was hot. And so I was like, yeah, I'm hot. And luckily, by, by, seriously lucky, the guy that took me to prom was a football player and a good friend of mine. It was kind of a pity date. And he, um, he played for the New Orleans Saints, so he's 6'6", 260. He's one of the doormen there, and he's overhearing this, and he comes up to me, and he said, Leanne, no, no, you can't tell that guy you're hot. And I said, well, it's no surprise. I mean, we don't have air conditioning in here, Brad. I think it's pretty obvious. There, and I, this is, honest to God, how my brain is in, in normal gear. This is how I would think. And he said, but that's not what he thinks you're saying. What? Constantly, a whole other world through the, the, you know, the stained glass. He explained to me what he meant, and I said, but he's gross, and he's drunk. Why does he think, ew, am I that gross? And so then my whole self-esteem goes down, and I know that's judgmental, but you know drunks, so you're not good. Well, God, now that's judgmental. Okay, so <laughs> he um, says, you stand by me. He puts his arm around me, and he says to the guy, you know, leave, leave my friend alone. She's with me. I look up, and I say, Brad, I'm not with you. And this like, clump of claw on my shoulder, which I, I, even I knew meant stop. 
And um, so the guy left and, and whatever, waited for me. Brad took me home, lectured me. And it took a friend up here, a nice guy, to sit me down and say, look, I got a long list of stuff. You need to wear bras. You need to bring a t-shirt to change into. Don't put yourself out there. If you dress in a certain way, guys are going to think this. Girls are going to think this. Bosses are going to think this. Your teachers are going to think this. If you act in a certain way, if you, and it was the first time, and I was like, I guess I was like 22. It was the first time I went, wait. And I guess it was a theory of mine uh, awakening for me. I thought it, if I wasn't saying, here's my number, I'm so sassy in bed, I thought they would know, which who knows if you are or not anyway. I would be like, you know, if I wasn't in making an invitation, why would they think I was sending a message of an invitation? If I want something, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to put on a little nonverbal skit. I'm going to tell you. I thought that's how everybody did it. I, I, don't, I don't know how the brain ferrets out what's fake from not fake. I, I really... I don't understand how that's even, I, I don't believe the studies. I just say that can't be true. Stop it. Shut up. So otherwise, that means I'm so far behind. So, so that's one little story. I took it very literal. Well, in linguistics, it's also the tone and the prosody. And this one I do well at. It's not what you say. And we talked about that a little bit today. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. And I can pick up on this one. I can pick up on sarcasm. I may have to say, was that sarcasm? But I can, I can have some bells go off, you know, if people know how to deliver it. David Letterman, I can't read. I can't tell if he's being sarcastic or because he's so dry. So he's not, you know, he's, Don Rickles, I know he's being sarcastic because he's so overboard with it. Joan Rivers, overboard with it. But some of the comedians and some of the people I know just slide it in. It's the slid in ones, the really dry, witty people that I can't gather. Um, I had a professor once that asked me an opinion, and I told him my opinion. He asked, and he said, excuse me, what initials are behind your name? And I said, I'm n none. And he said, until you have a graduate degree behind your name, nobody wants your opinion. And I'm like, oh, God, I thought we were supposed to talk in these seminars. And well, I, huh? How did I miss? It says in the, so I bring the book to him, and I said, but it says we're supposed to have small group discussion, and what I don't understand. Well, he'd been teasing me. Who, how's that even a funny joke? Last I heard, he was working with SEALs out here somewhere, so he's, you know, you got him now. I don't know. Well, I don't know what his deal was, but that's a joke. Okay, haha, it insulted me. So, you know, this is one of those, you can teach kids a lot about this by putting them in dramatic art, by putting them in public speaking, by, by mirroring auditorily what you hear. And I would play tape recorders. I, I did really well in um, radio broadcasts because I, could, I can think quickly on my feet if it's facts. And I, um, I could play back and say, well, this sounds like Jessica Savage, who was a great broadcaster who sadly passed away in a car accident, and I would try to emulate her. And uh, so, you know, that, that I learned that by, now I'm sweating like a, a horse. So, oh, I get it. Why do you, I hear people talking because you, oh, yeah, okay. So, when, when someone were to say, like, your teacher, it, this is not me, pretend like you're a teacher and you're saying to the class, and you say, why do I hear people talking? We're going to be the kids that say, because you have ears? And we don't mean smart alecky. We're like, do you not know about physiology and ears? We're in ninth grade. You have ears. So it's another example of, you know, a lot of our kids get sent to the principal's office and they're kind of diagnosed there because their behavior looks so snotty. And it's really, they're just looking at you like, you teach and you don't know how the auditory process works? And they're, they're being, and then when they get a laugh from that, they keep it up. So then they're getting like this reinforcement, right, of how, ooh, laughter gets me jokes, laughter gets me a friend, laughter, oh, I'm going to spit out of my nose, that got me jokes. And some of the behavior is simply, okay, it's got to come off, simply so that, you know, we can uh, establish friendship circles. But the teacher may or may not hear that. So one of the things I try to tell to, uh, I do consulting with teachers and, and uh, school groups. Again, not my day job, but once a week, I, I try to donate uh, my time and efforts to that. And by donate, I don't always mean free. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm using the word I give. I don't even know what a better, I need a thesaurus. I work there, take that, one day a week in the field to try to you know, give back a little and whatnot and use my graduate degree instead of just my horsemanship. 
So um, I consult with them and I try to say, don't take it personal, it's not you. I remember when Dr. Atwood met with my mom and he explained to her why my father wasn't um, emotionally connected and he wasn't physically connected. And my mother said, and I wasn't either, and my still not. And my mother said, um, I always thought it was me. I thought you guys didn't hug me and hold my hand and whatnot because it was something I did. And I would say to her, well, did you see dad and I holding hands? Did you see dad and I hugging? Did you see me ever hug a boyfriend? Did you see dad? No, mom, it's not you. I, it makes me uncomfortable to hug you. You're thin and you're bony and, and I don't like that. I'll hug a big person or a, a normal sized person, but a thin little person, I, I literally feel like I'm gonna break them. It makes me like, oh, don't be too, oh, you're gonna break a bone. You know, and, and I really do feel that. You can feel their bones crack under your skin and I don't go for that. So I don't, I am not doing that. And so bless her heart, I, I try to tell people, it's not you. You want to use theory of mind, folks. It's Use your theory of mind. Get in that kid's head or that adult's head or your husband's head. And what are they thinking? They're thinking, I don't want to hug them, so of course they know that, so of course they're not going to take it personal because they know I'll break their back. It doesn't dawn on us that you're crying in your room saying, no one hugged me. I don't want to be hugged, so don't be, you see what I'm saying? It's a dichotomy there. So that's a linguistic, uh, you know, that isn't meant to upset anyone. Word comprehension, social language, tone. These are my favorite things. These are, you know, the layman's terms for, for uh, my linguistic nerdiness that I won't put on. But one of the uh, lexicons I have at the barn is, and I wish that was my barn, but sadly it's not that nice. I, um, but you can look it up under Kirkshire Farm and see more of my horses if you're so inclined. It may be my special interest, so I will say it a few more times. My, uh, my, my horses are in there, and I like to play. I like to have fun with words. I am a writer, and not just nonfiction. I write a lot of, I mean, non, yeah, I write a lot of fiction, and, and I enjoy writing articles and whatnot. Um, so I'll say, oh, the horses need their necklace, and don't forget their bracelets. And the kids will stare at me, and I'll say, what? what? Oh, you don't even know what a halter is. You don't know what a lead rope is. Um, those are called bell boots. And I'll say, well, I know that. But I'm just, you know, we wear a necklace, they wear a halter, and every time I say halter, I think of a girl in a halter without, and so, okay, get the halter and the lead line. You know, I have to, no one wants to play word games, and we're kind of, our little community of people on the spectrum do have fun with words. You'd think we didn't because it's such an instrumental part of language learning, but words, once we get a picture for them, oh my goodness, the fun we can have. And we will make up words like spectacular aneus and you know, spon you know, just put words together and pictures start exploding in my mind and we all giggle and we start to upgrade the next word and the next word and the next word. It becomes our own lexicon and we own it. But you know what I've noticed in all my studies in autism are anecdotal. I don't try to do research in the field unless it's in my field and that's language. Otherwise, I don't step out. I'm not qualified to step out of that. So I stay in the language area. And one of the things I notice is in our group, we understand each other's weird language. But when we go out to your world, it's like, that dog will hunt. That's just a dumb one. Ours are much better. <laughs> you know? So we get cocky with it, but it's fun to, to, um, to exchange that gift, I think. So the assumptions, you're like me and you have good verbal skills and you know, you're a little weird, but you're making good grades and you know, you're, you're quote unquote popular, even if you don't understand the concept of that. And you're getting along fine and you're making a C or a B average, you know, you're not gonna get support services, at least in most of the states and in most parts of the world. You're going to be told to just conform in A, B or C. You're not gonna have UCLA at your back door helping you. You're gonna be out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming with a cowboy to talk to, which isn't bad, but still. Um, <laughs> So these are the assumptions that I actually had um, on my report card. Um, this, it wasn't quite this nasty, this kid is lazy, but it was, it was similar enough. The, some of these are true. Why must that, why must that coworker be uncooperative? I've never had a full-time job that I've been able to keep long. I've never gotten a tenure track. I have really good teacher evaluations because I'll, I'll answer the phone at midnight to help a student. I do mastery learning, don't yell at me. I like mastery learning because that's what I had to use. And, and so I'm very good with students because I get to talk and they have to listen and they can't interfere. If I go to a meeting and I think it's dumb, I'm the one saying it's dumb, well, there goes your evaluation. So I understand that, but I can't seem to stop that impulsivity. I, I feel it coming out of my mouth and I go to grab it back in and it's out. So I have never held these jobs, um, which is, is crushing to me, because I went to school and I fought long and hard to get these degrees and now I can't teach, and it's, it's really sad. 
Are you just plain stupid? That one makes me mad. That one makes me like, you know, want to have a cat fight. I think my neighbor's emotionally disturbed. I actually overheard people saying these sorts of things about me and how could my husband pick me and how did I have this friend um, from our small town because she was very popular and nice and why would she spend her time with me? And I looked around and I thought, they're talking about me. And I was maybe from here to the screen away and I thought, you don't think I can hear you? You're not in a, you know, a soundproof room. So I got online, pretended I was my husband and got him interviews all over the Midwest and we moved. Because I was, you know, I, he came home one day and I said, uh, you have four interviews with this college, this college. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm not staying here. And he said, well, I'm, I'm full professor tenured. I'm staying. And I said, I don't care what you are. We're not staying here. These women hate me and I'm, I'm done. And he's like, well, I, I, how did you pretend you were me? Um, okay. Dear so-and-so, signed Dr. Willie. Not really hard. It's, you know, <laughs> Hello. So he did get a job and I, he's in finance. So do you want to guess how many... Well, this, I don't care if they hear it or not. They all know I think this. How many people in the finance department and the accounting department do you think may at least have a toe in the water of autism? <laughs> we talk about engineers and computer scientists and a lot of actors and actresses. Those finance guys are right up there with you. <laughs> so there, we're, we're, we fit in fabulous with those guys. So you're just making things up to get attention. When we left Missouri, um, I, we, our daughter had been diagnosed from the University of, Missouri, of Kansas. Of Kansas. And she had two full day evals. It was two six hour evaluations with uh, neuropsych and a developmental ped and OT and, you know, speech language, everybody that you could think of. And, um, you know, they said, you know, we didn't get anything out of her at first. And we were worried about twin talk. We were, she was six, just turned six. We were worried about, you know, maybe low IQ. And by the end, or by the, I don't know, the middle or the end of the second day, it all started coming out because my daughter wouldn't talk. So she would just sit there and, and just stare. So she was, in effect, failing everything but not showing her strengths. Sally Ann, she got involved and got mad because she took the little thing out of the Sally Ann uh, basket and threw it, you know, and they started seeing, oh, here comes the real girl. And so I came to this uh, experimental psychologist at the university we were at, and I said, um, yes, we got good news. Meredith has Asperger's. Oh, my God. All right. Well, I just said her name. Well, that's okay. Um, I said, my child has Asperger's syndrome, and, you know, she's fantastic, and that's, I'm so excited to hear that because... Half my family was going, Team Aspie, Team Aspie. And so um, he said, this is so ridiculous. You guys are just saying this. Maybe you're making this up to get attention. And I thought about that, and I thought about that. And a couple days later, I thought, and I said, you know, if I want to get attention, I'm going to say I have something really cool, some, like I'm an alien, like I'm from a third dimension, like I'm um, God and female version. I'm not going to say I have a form of autism to get attention. Were you insane? And then my husband by then said, yeah, we got to get out of here because <laughs> you're not making us any friends, so we've got to move. And it just, I, I kind of championed for my daughter and my dad, no, 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 no. You don't get to talk about us like this. I'm almost neurotypical, and it was hard work to get here. We can do it. You are the people that are helping us do it. If there was no point in what you're doing, what are you doing it for? If there was no end game where we were going to be having a better quality of life, why are we here? So I'm not making it up to get attention. I'm making it up to say, look how cool this can be when we work with this kid and she has this unique personality of the best of all possible worlds. That's pretty awesome. And that was my intent. I'm a little hostile about that statement because it was about my daughter and you just don't mess with my kids. So, and my favorite, um, that lady is just plain rude. Okay, that part is true, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why that's true, but it, it is, I am rude. That boy in the grocery line sure is spoiled. You've seen those kids. One thing that, um, that Dr. Atwood taught me, and my father certainly taught me early on, he said, I don't care what your issues are. There's no excuse for poor behavior. You do not get to slap your grandmother. You do not get to kick the, um, the, the pews in church. You do not get to cross the street without someone holding your hand. That's a no. And it was a no, and no meant no, and meant no, and no, and there was no. You knew that that was no. It may have taken him years, months, weeks, days, hours. I don't know what it took him, but one, wrong was wrong in my house, and there was a clear line. Now, I'm told that's rigid thinking, and that's you know, um, black and white thinking, but for me, I needed that, because if he said you can cross the line, okay, for example, I went to New York, and I called my husband. I said, so yeah, up here in New York, you can run. When the sign says, um, don't walk, you can run. He said, no, you can't. And I said, I'm telling you, you can. I'm watching people run. 
And he said, you know, you can't. And I said, I am telling you, people are running. And he said, does the sign say don't run? And I said, it doesn't have to. It just says don't walk. And he said, that's not true. And I said, I'm running now. And he said, you can't do that. Because at home, we'd get, you can get a ticket for jaywalking. So you know, I know no walking means stop and wait to the light. New York, everybody's crossing. They're, you know, they're going. Well, I talked to my friends from New York, and they said, no, we're just rude. You know, we just want to get there. We're just in a hurry. We're just fast. We just know we have time. We're, it's a fight between the taxi drivers and us. Now I go to Chicago, Midwest, New York sentiments. My daughter lives there. Every time we go, I'll be there tomorrow. I say to her, is it, we, do the run, and I'm, I'm, like, I'm like a racehorse ready to go. And she'll, she's taller than me, and she has long arms, and she'll be like, no, stop. Or she'll be like, come on. I don't know what to do. They're running, walking, stopping, moving. They're, they have no rules. They're just, they're wildcats there. And so I can't generalize New York, uh, run. Missouri, you better not. Chicago, it's up for grabs. I don't know, but it's, it's cool when you see, no is no. I know you do not throw a fit in a grocery store. Your dad's going to pick you up. You're going to sit in a car until you've learned why you didn't go in that grocery store, and you're going to try again. And if you throw a fit, back out you go, and again and again and again. I don't mean to be cruel, but this is how I train my horses, and, and it works. So I'm not ju I don't care what tool is in your toolbox or what you use to help your kids. I say use whatever you... I was raised with uh, my dad's version of ABA. He didn't, you know... But for me, no excuse for poor behavior. That having been said, when my daughter would have issues, I would often take a moment to educate people and say, my child has sensory integration difficulties, my child has literal language problems, my child has a small form of autism, you know, this is, I'm DSM-4, so things were a little bit different then. But, and I, I would make these comments so that people would know it wasn't intentional, and then I'd take her out. I, I never interrupted with other, my dad taught me a long time ago, don't disrespect the rights and privileges of others. And so, but what's happened to me now is when I'm out and about and someone's letting their kid do that, no matter just they're naughty that day or whatever, I have a fit because that's wrong. So now I'm like really rigid in that. And that's not what I don't think what my dad, well, it probably is what my dad intended, but not what the world intended. So how would you feel? You know, that's, are you on the outside looking in? That's me in the middle. I'm just like, I, I, I fit in. People accepted me, but I didn't want to be fitting in. I didn't want to be asked to the parties. I didn't want to be... Uh, expected to show up or come or be on the beach at a certain time. I wanted to be alone. And um, Susan was going to do something with me last night, and I wrote her and said, you know, I'm going to, I did go to bed early because I'm three hours ahead of you guys. And I was so, I knew she'd get it. She'd be like, oh, yeah, what? Are, other people take offense to that. Oh, you don't like me. What did I do? No, I just, I'm nervous. I just want to cuddle by myself in this corner of this room and play Heyday for a while. It's a game on the computer. And so um, that's okay with me, but my daughter takes this to an extreme, and, and, and that becomes a worry. So in this regard, I'm not a rigid thinker. And do you scream? I scream a lot. I, in fact, I have nodules. I used to have a really nice voice. And that sounds bragging. I don't have a lot of things I do well. One, I did used to have a really nice voice, and now I can hear that little, uh, which is, okay, you know, don't shake your head and go, yeah, I hear it. No, you're supposed to go, no, it's beautiful. I'm kidding. I have no pride or ego. You can say whatever you want at this point. So, but yeah, right? You can feel it. You can, teachers, we all, all every teacher has it. So you know what I mean. And I, I was a teacher for a year in elementary school, high school, in college for 20, but um, not in, I, so these are just a cutting. I'm a recovering bulimic. Um, maybe three times a year I slip. Um, I do self-interest behavior. I don't like to talk about it because that uh, it has such a bad, connotation, so my therapist suggests I not really talk about it. If you want information on that from me, I can email you, but I don't want to, I don't, I have bits of panic attacks when I, when I uh, wander there too far. So um, I got by with a little help from you guys, support, advice, help, guidance, assistance, my animals, neighbors, call my mom and dad and say she's in the sewer again, call the fire department. The fire department would come, Leanne, Leanne, I'm down here, okay, we're throwing the hose down. I, I, my, the community supported me. They knew where and what I was about to. Now, I don't know that you can do that, but, but we sure could in the 60s. Books, this is the, the bookmobile. Raise your hand if you had a bookmobile. Is it the best <laughs> environment known to mankind? Oh, my Lord. My teachers were sure, my first grade teacher said you couldn't read beyond the blue label. Forget that. I wanted to go read the horror stories in black, and I was a very early reader. So I, I don't know that I understood anything I was reading, but I understood blood and gore. So I would go get that. 
But I love the bookmobile, and books took me to places and showed me things that I didn't know were possible. Bibliotherapy, if you will, using books to help me in cognitive and in behavior therapy, showed me that there were other ways to believe and think. And my mom would always say, I know what you're reading, because you don't talk Southern, so you're not Southern. What did you just read? You know, why are you wanting me to make hot dish? We're not from Minnesota. And I would, I would sophisticate an echolalia of the book into my real life. And if the book, like one of the characters broke their arm, I'd say to my mom, I think my arm's broken. And she'd wrap it in flour and let me go to school with flour and band-aids on my arm, saying it was broken. Of course, it was off by third period, but you know, I became the characters in my book. I can see where you'd say that that is some sort of psychosis or some sort of, you know, some one person did accuse me of shouldn't say accuse me, tried to diagnose me with multiple personality disorders because I kept saying, what personality do you want me to use? And I was earnest. I said, do you want me to be the small town girl? Do you want me to be the professor? Do you want me to be the elementary school teacher? The ingenue, which that's a complete waste of time and joke. What do you want me to be? And they said, well, are voices talking to you? What do you mean, what do I want you to be? And I said, well, I'm not sure who, who you want me to, how you, just tell me, what do you want me to be like? Well, you're in therapy, be yourself. And I said, right, which one? I get that now. At the time, I was trying to comply with the rules of therapy. I even said, do I have to lay down on this couch? I didn't, those commercials shouldn't even be on, that's just stupid. <laughs> and I told you about the neighbors. I'd go to the neighbors and say, can I play with Heidi and Penny? Heidi and Penny were dogs. And uh, Diane and Steve lived in the house, and they would say, you sure you don't want to play with the kids? No, I'm good. <laughs> I want Heidi and Penny. Civic groups, my dad was the Girl Scout mom, and uh, we went to uh, you know, Camp Carlage and the Cedar Lodge, and it was wonderful because my Girl Scout teachers would say, you know, you're part of the group, but eh, you're not really getting along with Team A, so how about you help me and Mrs. Smith, and we'll do the... They all, the adults in my life always brought me in. I think it might be because they saw my dad was raising me, and they might have felt I needed a female figure. Whatever they did, for whatever reason, they saved my life because they taught me adult skills, like we talked about earlier, adult skills, and so that didn't translate into childhood skills, but it gave me survival skills, and that was neat. I didn't hang around with kids anyway. That's Blaze, my first horse. I had ponies, that's my first horse. Notice I'm dressed in boys' clothes. My dad, I was 13 there, um, like I said, my first tall horse as opposed to ponies, and my dad took me um, to a store. My dad shopped with me, so where do you think an Asperger's syndrome father would take his daughter to shop? In the boys' department. So I only wore boys' clothes. Oh, I love that horse. And my dad got me a pool because I loved water therapy. And it wasn't a big, expansive pool. It was an above-ground pool. But getting in the water and doing water therapy was instrumental to my peace of mind and to my anti-anxiety. One day, the pool broke. My dad came out and said, looks like we'll need to get another pool. Get in the car. So we got in the car, and by that night, I had another pool up. He was keeping ledgers and notebooks of me and what helped and what didn't help. I was, he was like Freud, but not a creepy Freud. And I was you know, his, um, his patient. I love stimming and repetitive movements, but lucky for me, I guess, if you would, I, I didn't do a lot of, I do hand wringing, but I don't do any of this. Um, ring my hands, which many of us do. I rock, but I learn to say when people say, you're rocking, I say, oh, I know, I just love holding my babies. See, I can learn that. I, give, me some, give me a standard and I'm on it. I can fake it. Just, just to give me it. Give, um, social script me, but then don't take me out and say, you're not, you don't have a baby in your arms, so why are you swaying? Then I'm like, uh, what? Why'd you, you ruined it? and I will have that discussion. So my dad kept the basement open. My mom wanted to fix it for parties and stuff. Like, my dad and I are gonna have a party, please. That's not even in the scheme of things. And so we kept it open, and I could roller skate 365. I could hula hoop. I could you know, run. I could jump rope. The whole basement was my indoor playground. So again, even though I wasn't doing much in PE, I had a full plate on my, uh, in my um, daily routine that involved the horses, playing with the dogs, riding my bicycle exactly 10 miles, carrying it if I went beyond, and going up and down the driveway if I went below until I hit 10. Um, and roller skating was awesome. I can't do, uh, what's the one thing? The one skate? Oh yeah, rollerblades, who invented that? That's not right, because at least roller skating, you had a chance. Now my kids are struggling on stupid rollerblades. Sensory deprivation, do you remember forts? You'd put up like outdoor, um, see what you young people are missing on your computers? I could play Heyday under there and have the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> so you, um, you go under, you know, you take the backyard stuff and you turn it into a fort. And you guys, when I was in there, I was convinced no one knew I was in there. 
They had no idea I was in there. I thought it was like an invisible cage, not like literally invisible, but like no one saw me come in here. No one would guess I was in here. No one would ever know. So I can sit here and observe. And then my neighbor Steve would come over and jump on it. And I'd be like, how'd you know I was in here? Well, you're in here every day, but I don't know. Lucky guess. So, but I loved it because it gave me this little feeling of being behind the curtain and watching the world. I, in my head, am Shakespeare, and I can watch you and direct you, and if, if I had my druthers, you'd all have strings on you, and I would puppet you, because I like to play with you, but I don't want you to play with me. I want to play with you and tell you what to do and where to sit and how to behave, and I want to direct you. And I wonder how many directors, let's think Steven Spielberg, we don't know for sure, but he did have an autism diagnosis. I wonder how many aren't on the spectrum, because I love telling people what to do. My teachers, I actually made this thing in the front, this little outfit for a, a class, only I couldn't do it because it involved way too much fine motor, and I couldn't read the directions of a, have you ever tried to sew? That's hard stuff. And so my mom had to sew me in it before I went to the fashion show, and so the teacher took one look at that and said, here's the mic. Phone and I, I'm, I and emceed that as well. So again, nice community of teachers. But um, they were good enough to say, all right, what's your strength? Oh, you know, you like to enunciate. You like to help other kids. You're the one that shows the new kids in school where the gym is and the, you know, the cafeteria and how to, you, that's, you're, you're sort of the, um, you're the student government type. You do that. And it, it, I didn't need an IEP. I, they pulled me out of math and put me into remedial math. They put me into AP English because they saw I had a strength there. I was just either very blessed or it was the, the free flow early 70s where we all just you know peace out and got along. I don't know why I was so uh, blessed to have this environment. But those teachers, I said, I can't take a shower in front of other people. I can't stand water on me. I have to be totally submerged. And the teacher said, well, then I'll never forget Mrs. Blake, junior high. She said, well, you're going to smell. And I said, okay. And she said, are you okay with that? And I said, well, yeah, everybody smells. That perfume is disgusting, and sweat's disgusting, and, you know, deodorant's disgusting. So, I mean, it's just another, okay, well, you want to smell. And they told me the consequences. One kind of icky thing, um, when I'd have my um, period, I, I'd have it irregularly, and I never knew. I couldn't keep track on a, con on a calendar when it was coming. And I, um, I have a lot of testosterone in my body. And I would have my period, and I would uh, stand up, and my friends would say, you need to go to the nurse. You know, here I am, like, 18 years old. I could have been, like, you know, today I probably would have been mean girled right out of the school. But back then, they'd say, Leanne, go to the nurse. And I'd get to the nurse, and she'd say, oh, again, girl, go home. And they'd let me out of school to go home, get a new pair of pants. I never, never, I never, I had a hysterectomy at 35 because I was done. I said, gut me, give me a tummy tuck, let's call it a day. And, I, and it was the best thing I ever did because I couldn't do it. I'd, oh, I just have so many sad stories about that. Isabella Hinault is a fabulous sexologist in um, uh, Quebec. And um, she wrote a chapter in a book I edited, and she's wonderful. Difficult conversation to talk about. I don't like doing it because I have three daughters, um, and it embarrasses them. So um, if you want to contact on that, she does beautiful, non-embarrassing speeches on that. But she might be quoting some of the stuff that I do, so look out. You doctors in the building, uh, I, now I didn't know that, I, to confess, I don't look at people's resumes before I come here, the other speakers, because I'm quickly and easily intimidated. And I'm glad I didn't, because I wouldn't have shown up today if I'd looked at these two ladies. I would not have shown up. So um, I didn't know it was going to be a lot on ABA. I'm totally fine with that, but my, um, uh, my modus operandi tends to be CBT with a lot of ABA looking. And I, uh, the man I work with is one of the only pediatric neurologists in the state of Michigan, so he handles the neurology part. So I have a good team that I work with and rely on when I do any of my consulting. I don't do anything without running it through all of those people. So CBT is the stuff uh, that makes the most sense to me. I'm like Dr. Atwood who taught me, you know, put in your toolbox everything you can that you think will work and then you individualize to the student. And I think we all agree that that's probably the way to go. So I like the emotion body and for me, uh, it has to be uh, very literal, it has to be very logical, it has to be pragmatic, it can't be very abstract, it has to be taught, retaught, and memorized. So I'm a combo CBT, ABA. Don't you know all those anor... An what are they? Okay, see I had a bunch of... <laughs> concussions. My husband and I both had our, our neuroimaging done, I think I told you. And we're, we're going to be in a home in about six weeks. I, I, not, there's not a lot going on up here anymore, and I've forgotten some of my language, so forgive me for sounding like a... Bleh. That's a terrible sound, I apologize. So, so this is how I like to do it, and this does make the most sense for me. But again, there's a lot of uh, other little elements put in. 
One of my early psychiatrists said to me, you know, instead of going by a label, today you're Aspie, tomorrow you're not even anything, the week before that you were, you know, uh, social anxiety, who, whatever. Let's just say you're having a hard time understanding people in small talk. How can we help you with that? That opened a door for me because it allowed me to, I, I look at my cousin who has autism and I think I, we're nothing alike. We are, but we're not. And so I felt I was ripping people with autism off saying, look how easy it is. I came from a different spot. So when you have the umbrella term autism, that makes me very nervous because I think we need the phenotypes and I think we need more specific definitions of what each area is. I'm linguistically challenged and so sensorily challenged more than any, okay, and anxiety more than anything else. So um, I like to say, um, you know, it, it, for me, it must be a pragmatic problem solving solution or it will go right over my head. Abstract stuff freaks me out. Although I am philosophical, if I do say so. So even after the support, you guys, there will be challenges. Um, my dad would say, he used to always say, put your thinking cap on. And for years, I looked for that dog on thinking cap. And I would be like, dad, it's not funny. Where'd you put it? Ugh. So there is no real thinking cap. But put it on and then start to analyze your life and your situation. And you guys, I have to do this every day. I can't find my ticket back to Michigan tomorrow, so my husband is sending it to me. I mean, I lose, my dad used to say, you're an accident waiting to happen, and you would lose your body if it wasn't attached to your head. So worrying won't, this is kind of my little pep talk end, worrying won't stop the bad stuff from happening. It just stops you from enjoying the good. I'm done saying I'm deficient. I'm done saying I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm done saying I'm not smart because I'm not a scientist like my father. I'm done saying I'm done. I want to just enjoy the last two years of life I have left. I, I want to ride my horses, and I just want to smile and be happy. And I, that's what I want for my kids on the spectrum. Take a deep breath. My dad used to say, if it's not going to kill you, move on. And then he'd say, and by the way, even if it does kill you, life will go on without you. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the reality, have you ever had, and I know you have, had a memory that sneaks out of your eyes and rolls down your cheek? I cry a lot. A lot of people in the spectrum don't feel that emotion. I don't cry because I want to. I cry because I, have, I literally have leaky tears. I cry easily when I'm laughing, when I have to tinkle. <laughs> All the, I just cry. But when I'm very sad, I do cry badly. I cry horribly, screaming. It's like purging for me. I don't see, I'm an all or nothing kind of uh, brain. Okay, we're either going to go to a dance party in a minute or bring in Kino. Trust is like an eraser, it gets smaller and smaller. And that's what I'm saying about um, my smiling people and being around men. Uh, the people that got me, one was a friend, quote unquote, and one was a policeman. And they're not supposed to do bad things to you. And so I don't trust people anymore, and I don't think that's ever going to change. Out of difficulties grow miracles. The miracle of all that is uh, it's not going to happen to my kids. Um, my daughter was beat up very badly, as I said, and um, uh, there's, there's a lot of issues related to that. And now every time she dates somebody at 24, I meet the potential mate. And I, say, I look him in the eye and I say, nobody's ever going to hurt my child and you will hear from me and every attorney and my FBI friend should my child come up hurt. And I sound like this really badass person and well, you know what? Mama's here. The other two are like, don't open your mouth, don't come here, don't meet him, don't talk to him. But this one, I get to just say, nope, not going to happen on my watch. Got our big dog too. Keep calm and carry on. My dad said this way before it was cool, but he was a World War II vet. No one has everything figured out, right? We all make mistakes. Donald Trump's been bankrupt, what, 52 times? Uh, you know, I mean, everybody stumbles and falls and makes a misstep, every single human. Intuition is your best friend. Nurture it, develop it, embrace it. We're finding in anecdotal studies, and now some people are doing uh, uh, neurology studies and other studies to say that our gut speaks really loudly to us. I don't want to say seventh sense, but in our, our sixth sense, but in a way it is maybe. You know, if we are not tuned in socially as naturally as you guys are, maybe something else speaks to us. And maybe it's like that mother's intuition. You know when your kid's sick, maybe. Or my dad's intuition was fabulous. He knew when I was, you know, going to sneak my bicycle out. He'd come home and catch me. And I think we, I'm now listening to my gut. And yesterday I said to myself, don't go out. You're going to meet somebody that's going to scare you. Don't go out. But I had to go on that wharf and look at those sea lions. So I went out, and a guy did scare me, and I ran home, and I thought, how did I know that? I don't know. I don't know. Woo! -hoo -hoo. Those are my people. 
and um, my babies, and because of them, I have tried extremely hard to make myself as close to neurotypical as I'm comfortable getting, because I don't want their families and their employees and their employers and their friends to not want to come to our home, to not want to be part of my, their lives, because I am a little different. My southern relatives are often embarrassed by my Yankee behaviors. That's what they think it is. Here's a Yankee. I want to fit in when I need to, and I want to be me when I need to. I like being bilingual. So I have a self-affirmation pledge that I wrote for people on the spectrum. I included some supports for you guys that, I, you know, just my teacher education, language support, social interaction, nothing you won't have, have thought of on your own, but I just compiled them for you. I have a hard time with perseveration, as most of us do, so I established a little support group for that. General supports, these are all in books and things I've written, and now my daddy. Um, my daughter saw him fall and saw him um, take his last breath. We had to take him off life support. He is the, if, if we all realize that every human, you know, if people say that if you're on the spectrum, you can't have emotion and you can't love anybody and what are you worth to society and that, this man would have given his left arm to anyone. In the 60s, he drove around, he took um, African Americans to work and Jewish people to work and poor people to work and he sat by the people that worked in his, in his, um, in his um, laboratory. He, did, he was never a good old boy. And he was never one to dismiss anyone. He had a little fit when two of our African American friends weren't being served at Steak and Shake. He had a fake heart attack and broke everything. He stood up for the little guy and he was beat up every day and had to go to a psychiatrist to prove he was okay enough to handle top secrecy things during Vietnam. And it makes me ill that anyone would think someone so wonderful and so kind and so gentle, and he was the only friend I ever had. And now he's gone, and it's been five years. He told me he wanted to be cremated and go wherever I went, and I left him home this time, but I wear him in a locket. I'm trying to, I sleep with his ashes. It's very creepy, but he said he wanted to be with me. So, um, in his honor, I hope that you um, look towards the people, the elderly, we're growing up, help us as we get older. Look towards your neighbors, your friends, anyone who's different, and give them a hand or a note or a book or a letter or whatever support they need to let them know that we're all humans, we're all in this together, and because of all of us, we can get through anything. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne.